I don't think that there's anything inherently special about me. Like, people go through tough times every single day. And so what I've been through doesn't make me special and it doesn't make me unique and it doesn't differentiate me at all. But I think I'm really proud of my ability to be able to share the lessons I've learnt with people. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter, candid conversations that count. Taria Pitt has been through a lot in her 31 years. She's been caught in a bushfire and survived, recovered from having 70% of her body burnt, learnt to walk again, written three books, her latest called Good Selfie. She's gotten engaged to her long-term partner, Michael. She's raised millions of dollars for charity and run two ultramarathons. She's also changed hundreds of thousands of people's lives just by telling her story. When I last interviewed Taria four years ago, she was at a really significant crossroads in her life. Her accident and a large part of her recovery was behind her, and she'd just gotten engaged to Michael. Her future was looking brighter than it had since her accident, and she was looking forward towards reinvention and new chapters. Over 100,000 of you have listened to the first No Filter interview I did with Taria in 2015, and as you can imagine, four years on, we had a lot more to talk about. Last time I saw you, Terea Pitt, you just got engaged. Yeah. Did you get married in the end? No, we haven't. I know you've had a baby since I've had then. a baby, yeah. So we've got a lot to unpack. You've written a new book. I have written a new book and I'm very proud of it. Yeah. I want to get to that in a second. Actually, let's start with that because right. it's a book for teenagers. Go ahead. You go for it, girl. Why teenagers? I guess there's a couple of reasons. So first of all, I get asked a lot of questions from adult Australians. But I also get asked a lot of questions from younger Australians as well. And I noticed that a lot of the questions were were vaguely similar. There was Mm. was kind of a common theme with all of them. And they were really just questions about, you know, how do I get through hard times? How can I be more confident like you? Even though the questions didn't say it explicitly, it was just about building resilience and that sense of self-belief. And then when I was pregnant with my son, I started to think about what messages would I want to impart to my child? And at first I thought I just wanted to be happy because, you know, you're a parent, me as well. That's what you want for your kid. Yeah. But that's not realistic and that's not a realistic expectation to have of them to be happy all of the time. So I thought more than happiness, I wanted Huckabye to have a strong sense of self-belief and have resilience as well. And I guess they're the key messages that I hope are, are imparted in the book. There's so much said about you and resilience. You've Mm. almost become the poster child for resilience. And resilience is such a buzzword because we talk about, you know, there are all these concierge parents and helicopter parents and our kids are soft and, Mm. you know, all of these things. Do you feel like you can never complain about anything because you have to be resilient all the time because that's your brand scene makes it sound cynical, but it's like that's what you've become known for is your incredible resilience. Yeah, but I think that's... I don't portray that I'm always resilient, you know, and I think that's really important because when kids go on Instagram and they see these perfect, highly filtered, highly edited photos of someone living a, a dream life in the Bahamas, they compare their life to that and they go, well, I'm not in the Bahamas sipping on a cocktail, so that means my life is crap, you know, and that's a really long bow to draw. But a lot of people go there. Mm. So I don't try and portray that every morning I'm full of motivation and super energetic and super excited to get on with my day. Like some days I am. Today's been a really great day and I've been really excited. I get to talk about my new book. So I feel good. But some days you might feel like crap. You might not have had enough sleep. You might have had a fight with your spouse. You might be dealing with some really big personal issues at home. And I think when you feel like that, it's actually quite empowering just to own it. And just say to yourself, you know what, today's crap, Mm. that's okay, tomorrow might be better. What do those bad days look like for you? For me, a bad day is usually about anxiety Mm. when it's just like bubbling to the surface and I can't Mm. quite get a handle on it. What does a bad day look for you? Can I just ask you a question? What do you do with that when it's bubbling on the surface? Sometimes I tell someone, like I'll say to my husband, I'm really struggling with anxiety today. And is that helpful? Very. Yeah. And I just try to remind myself that it will pass. Yeah. So that, that's the same theme though. You, you remind yourself that, you know, it's not literally tomorrow is going to be better, but you're still saying to yourself, yeah, it'll pass and then the next stage will be better. So it's the same thing. And that's such an important message 
for young people, isn't it? Particularly yeah. because we know the suicide rate's very high and yeah. it, we, suicide is sometimes referred to a permanent solution for a temporary problem. Yeah. And in that moment, you can feel it's never going to get better. For sure, 100%. They're some of the issues that I hope my book deals with. Mm. So for you, what does a bad day look like? Is it about pain? Is it about mental health? Is it about frustration? Probably frustration. Not really pain, not not so much mental health, but maybe, you know, I've had a big fight with Michael or a fight with my mum or things aren't really working for me at the moment. So there are things you can do to not snap out of it, but make yourself happier. What do you so do? for example, when I go on social media, I don't usually walk away feeling better, yeah? Mm. So... If I'm not feeling good, it's probably not a good idea for me to go on social media, yeah? Mm. But when I go for a run, I feel better. When I go for a surf, I feel better. If I get in the ocean, I feel better. So I've got all those strategies there that I know will make me feel better. But sometimes I think it's okay as well just to say, today's shit, that's okay. I'm just going to own it and go with it, yeah. In business, it's often called the deep trough of pain and I always advise Mm. other business owners to just say, sometimes just as you say, acknowledging it, going, ah, deep trough of pain. Yeah. That's where I am today. Yeah. And knowing that you will get out of it, but that it's just shit. Yeah. In this moment. Yeah. And you don't have to pump yourself up. You don't have to try and turn it around and feel good. If you want to, you can. You know, there's heaps of strategies in the book that say that, but if you don't want to, just own it. Yeah. You mentioned um, going for a run, going for a surf. Yeah. You obviously had a really long way to climb back from yeah. your time in hospital totally. and after the fire. Totally. And you couldn't walk, you couldn't sit up at one, you know, for a long yeah. time. Are you now at full physical capacity? No, I don't think anyone is. If you ask an Olympic athlete if they're at full physical capacity, they've always got something that they're working on or that they're trying to improve. And I think – that's life. I know, you know, with your business, I could say, oh, well, are you at full capacity? But you probably have all of these ideas that you want to do and you want to grow and you want to reach more people. So I think if, uh, you know, for me to be at full capacity, that would mean that I'm stagnating. And I, I always like to be making progress. And I think that's what makes us happy as well. You know, moving towards things that we want for ourselves, mm. that gives us a really deep sense of happiness. Let's talk about some of the progress you have made since we last spoke. Mm. You had just got engaged, as I said. Yeah. You were wearing your engagement ring around your neck. Yes. Is it I still lost, there? No, I lost it. <laughs> I lost it. I'm Babe. bad. I'm not bad. But like, I was like, oh, I'm not going to wear it because I want to save it. And then, but it's a really beautiful story about the ring. So when when I first had my accident and they flew me to Sydney and they said to Michael, oh, she's there's a high chance that she's not going to make it to to prepare him, to inoculate him. And so he bought a ring and he said to his dad, if she survives, I'm going to marry her. I know, isn't it sweet? (laughs) So he bought me this ring with like this money that he inherited from his grandma. Uh So it was imbued like with so much meaning. You know, it was a ring that he bought like when I was going to die and then I lost it. So, but I... What's the good part of that story? Oh, I was just filling in time, you know, just chewing, <laughs> just chewing the fat. Um, there was no good part. I, I think it's just like, yeah, I feel bad for losing it. But then, what was I going to do? Not wear it? Like, you know. Well, that's a really good example of dealing with a setback because you could go, "Oh my God, it was so symbolic and it meant so much," and his grandmother and the time, and it's all ruined now. How did you talk yourself through that? Well, honestly, I was like at the airport. Huckabye was crying and so I gave him the ring to distract him to play with it and then the flight was boring so I rushed and there's a good Huckabye in my bags and blah 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 and then on the plane I was like shit yeah. I've left it there but you know there's always an upside someone is probably walking around with a beautiful engagement ring you know they might ask their girlfriend to marry them there's all that oh, that's a nice way of looking at it I know isn't it I'm such a sweetheart just leaving precious gems all over the city I asked you um when you were last here about pregnancy yeah. and about physically how that would go. Yeah. How did that go? Look, I don't really have anything to compare it with, Mia, because I was never pregnant before being burnt. Was the skin on your stomach burnt? Uh, on your torso? No, some of it, yeah. So I found it relatively easy, but I don't have any reference point. But I was asking you, I remember, if it had stretch in it. 
because obviously this you need a lot of elasticity in your stomach when you get pregnant. Your body yeah. changes so much. Uh, were there any specific issues that affected you that that wouldn't have had you no. not had the accident? No. no. But we, our obstetrician, he's really old school. And he had this rule that if you were a patient with him, you had to stay in the hospital for seven nights. Oh, I like I, him a lot. I know, but we were like, seven nights? That's ages. Like, why do I have to stay Like, if, if nothing's wrong? And he just said, trust me, you're going to be a new mom. You'll appreciate it. And it was so cool because we stayed mm. there for seven nights. It was like this little beautiful little cocoon with my, you know, my little family. And when we look back at it now, we think, oh, that, that was such a special such a special moment in both of our lives, you know. Did and you it, like being pregnant? Yeah, I did. Oh, well, I had it. Like I said, it was relatively easy, you know. I wasn't. Um, I wasn't too sick. I didn't find it too onerous. So I, I really enjoyed it. The only thing I didn't like was that I couldn't surf. Oh, that was annoying. Hard to lie on your stomach to paddle out. Yeah, back. so I had like a um, a surf mat. You'd spent so many years fighting your body, I suppose, or having issues with your body, was it a bit of a a reset in terms of look at what my body can do or have you always had that relationship with it? Um, Because growing a baby is pretty amazing. I know people who've had eating disorders have spoken about that. People who've had illnesses have spoken about that. Yeah, I think it's pretty awesome what the body can do. Like the body is so resilient. But I'm also – I'm quite pragmatic, Mia, so I think, well, it is incredible and it's a miracle but – there's six billion people on this planet <laughs> and I'd say approximately two and a half of them have had babies. So it is a miracle but at the same time it, it's what it's what we do, it's what humans do, you know, where that's what mm. – well, I don't want to delve into that but, you know, we're here to reproduce sort of thing. How was the birth? I, I also loved that. Talk me through it. Um, so it started off – I was – Two days overdue, so we'd gone for like a, a four-wheel drive and I was making this eggplant. A four-wheel drive? Yeah. I haven't heard of that one to bring on well, labour. I don't, I don't know. Um, I went to see an acupuncture, then I was making this eggplant parmigiana, which I'd read on the internet was oh. uh, a very effective labour-inducing Sex. recipe. I, I really didn't feel like it. I don't know why. Funnily I mean, enough, I at like, nine you know, months and two days. Yeah, I just, you know, and um, I was at my house. And I was being silly with Michael and I did this really loud fart mm. and Michael and I, we don't fart in front of each other. Mm. That's, and that's, that's because Michael doesn't fart. It's really weird. Really? Yeah. He doesn't fart. So then I feel inappropriate when I fart in front of him yeah. because he doesn't fart in front of me. So I like to, you know, respect. <laughs> that as a boundary. Yeah, as a boundary. Yeah. And he, Michael says it's nice to have, you know, some boundaries. I assume you're a bathroom door closed kind of couple no I don't and he I it's you know it's a it's, it's an a, open bathroom well when you've got kids it's always open bathroom door no, but the Michael's mum. Michael's quite a private person mm, yeah he likes to close the door he does yeah so you let out a big fart so I let out a big fart and Michael was there and he was like Taria so I started giggling hysterically like ah, oh, I'm pregnant I don't know what came over me and then I felt this pop and this <gasps> stuff gushed down my leg and I looked down and I, I said to Michael, I think my waters are broken. Wow. And Michael said, are you sure you just didn't wet yourself, Dal? <laughs> it happens. Yeah. And then I went into the shower and my mum was there as well. So mum was running around like a mad woman, call an ambulance, call an ambulance now, now, now. And Michael, you know, thank goodness for Michael, he's very calm, mm. steady, solid. He said, no, get in the shower, I'll call the hospital because the hospital was two hours away. Oh. Yeah. That's what had you'd obviously planned for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so had a shower, hopped in the car, listening to my calm birth track. Had the contraction started? Yeah, they'd started by then, but they were only small. So you know like when you period like, pain. Yeah, and you know when you're getting through them, you're like, oh, this is like I'm actually doing it. <laughs> this calm birth track I'm listening to is so amazing and I'm like a really effective meditator because I'm just like riding the waves and just, you know, being really <laughs> awesome. So I felt like really like, yeah, I've got this sort of thing. We got to hospital and Michael turned on the cricket because, you know, he wanted to check in and see what the game was doing yeah. at that at that point. And then my contractions just intensified and intensified and intensified. And fast forward 12 hours. 12 hours. Yeah, the baby still hadn't come. 
And did you have some drugs? I had. I just had the gas. How was that? Um, I well, I have gas on the reg. I was going to say, do you so have not, a high pain so threshold? So not not on the reg, not on the reg. I don't have like <laughs> nitrous oxide at home that I just hook up to. But whenever I go in for an operation, I I have the gas beforehand because I get I get nervous when I get anaesthetized because it's very difficult to find a vein on me. So when they're finding a vein on you, Mia, it might take them a couple of minutes, but on me, sometimes it takes like an hour. It takes a wow. while. So I, I get nervous. So they give me the, of the gas. damage to your arms. Yeah. So they give me the gas just to, you know. Calm keep, you down. Calm me down. So that's all I had at that point. And then it was 7.30 in the morning and my obstetrician came in and he had a quick look and he said, what you did last night was pretty much ineffective. Um, you haven't really dilated or progressed at all. That's what every woman in labour wants to hear. Yeah, I know. So I was like, and you know, I'm I'm a guy getter. I'm yeah. determined. I've got endurance. But hearing that, I was just like, oh, I was like, I don't know if I really want to keep doing this. How many centimeters were you? Like three after more than twelve hours. Yeah, and he said you can keep doing what you've been doing, and your baby will probably be here in another twenty four hours. Or I can give you an epidural, you can have a sleep, and then the baby will be here. So I chose the epidural at that stage. Before you had the epidural, I was going to ask you how the pain of labour compares to the pain that you experienced after the accident. I think, like I saw the pain of labour as a good thing because it meant that I, like, I was going to get to meet my baby and... There's not much good that you can see in going through the pain that I've been in the past. You, you know what I mean? So I, th- yeah. I, I was excited about – and a bit apprehensive because I'd never been in labour before, but I was excited. So it was mentally a different kind of pain. Well, yeah, because it's like I'm, I'm going to meet my son. Like yeah. this, is his, this, this is his birthday. Like, so Michael and I were really excited about that, yeah. Were you excited about the epidural as well? Yeah, I was. But then when the anaesthetist came, he recognised me. He was like, you're that, you're a runner, aren't you? And he started talking to me about, you know, his morning run and all of this stuff. And I, you know, I was just like, can you just, like, oh, no. just, you know. Put the needle put in. Put the needle back. in, like, let's, you know, let's get on with it. And did he have any trouble putting the epidural I in? I don't think so. I don't really know, though. How did you feel after Great. that? Oh, well, I had a sleep. Isn't I had a best? I know, isn't it the best? I had a sleep and I got, they woke up, they were like, Taria, it's time to push now. <gasps> I know. You slept through the next seven centimetres. I know, I know. Isn't that a miracle? But it's like, see, the next baby I have, I feel, because if you are more relaxed and more just going with the flow, it makes sense that you would dilate more and that you would, you know, if if you could relax into the labour and I was probably not as relaxed as I would have liked to have been. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it just is sometimes it happens yeah, yeah. and sometimes yeah, it yeah, doesn't. Yeah, 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 exactly as well. So, yeah. Different strokes, right? Yeah. And, and isn't it funny how you spend so much time preparing for the birth and then when you look back you go, that's nothing. It's about the baby like, and what yeah. happens afterwards. So I fell asleep after he had come out. So wait, you pushed him out? Pushed him out. Baby, yeah. And I was like, eh, cool. You know, just wanted to go to sleep. Um, and I fell asleep and then I could hear – this foggy baby crying and I thought in my head, I was like, can someone shut that kid up? <laughs> and then I realised, man, it was my kid. And then I thought, oh, shit, this is, this is now my life. Here we yeah, go. Here we go. This is it. I didn't think I've heard of someone falling asleep straight after they gave birth. Well, you know, I sleep. I like eating, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like to sleep. Yeah. Did you breastfeed him? Yes, I did, yeah. How'd that go? It wasn't as easy as what I'd thought. Like you I, thought it would be easy? Well, it's like I've been, I thought, you know, when I was driving up to hospital, oh, this is easy. I've Billion. got this. Yeah. You know, I'm just riding these waves of contraction. So, yeah, I will, I guess I never really thought that much about it. But, yeah, I had to use those nipple shields. Had your breast been damaged in the accident? No, no. But you're pretty flat chested. Small right, chest. Well, you don't have big. Look, I'm holding my boobs. Either, no, I, so I do you know. now. Like it's they not, get they get bigger as you get older. There's no insult. I wish my boobs. No, no, were that's fine. I can run without a bra. Yeah, so, don't show off. Well, I'm just saying. You know, that's that's the benefit of having, you know, petite breasts. It's pretty amazing discovering that you can keep another person alive just using your body, isn't it? As it's like finding out you can make bacon out of your elbow or something. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? That, yeah. yeah, I'm hungry now. Um, yeah, I think it's. 
Uh, oh, it's the most beautiful and extraordinary thing I've ever experienced. Yeah, being a mum. And like I said earlier, I know that two and a half million on people on this planet have also done it, but it does feel really special with when it's you, you when and it's your you first, baby. And particularly your first time, yeah, I think. Yeah. And how was Michael through it all? I imagine he would be like a really good birth coach and stuff. He was good, but he was also kind of annoying. Why? Well, well, you're always annoyed at your partner when True. in that, and when he's like, "All right, Dal, a few deep breaths." It's like, "Shut up! You're not, you know." All right, Dal, let's just let's just tone it down a bit, you know. Just calm down. What so, surprised you most about giving birth? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you said breastfeeding was harder than you thought. I thought I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. And that you said you, you stayed for seven days, which is great. It's almost like being in a little womb, yeah, that's isn't what it? I mean. That's why it was cool. You yeah. know, you, you don't get that inundation of friends and family coming around. I remember at one stage I had like 10 people in my house and I felt like just saying to like screaming at them like, get out. You know, when you've had When a, you got home. When I got home, yeah, you've got a new baby and you're just tired. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be making cups of tea for, you know. You had, of course, that extra element that most new mothers don't have, which is that the media wanted photos of you mm. and your new baby. What was that like? Did you feel hounded? Did you make decisions that you would put a photo out to give yourselves, in a way, some privacy? Yeah, we did. So that's why we put a photo out there. But I was still pissed off, me because a photographer, I don't know, followed us home, was outside of our home and took photos when we took Huckabye out of the car and took him inside but at the same time um it's it, it comes with the territory and there's a lot of fantastic things about my job and I'm guessing your job too Mia you're in the public eye you know there's a lot of great things about our jobs and that's one of the bad sides and I, I don't think we can say yeah you know what I want all that stuff that gets sent to my house and I want all this and I want to have a platform and I want to be able to release a book and then come on me a show and talk about it I can't have that and then complain about people wanting to take photos. So I, I, I see it as coming with the territory. Do you think Instagram's changed it for celebrities that you can decide? Totally. Like you, you've devalued the paparazzi photos. Yeah, yeah, you? yeah. And you get to control the narrative too, you know. And I think I like so many people bag out social media and I get it. But at the same time, I think it's awesome. You know, you get to have this relationship with your fans and your audience, this real like one-to-one relationship you get to comment back to people and and see what they're thinking and 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 what they're writing and you get to put stuff out there that you know historically or maybe even a decade ago or two decades ago would never have happened you know like my book I I self-published that that would have been a very different thing to do two decades ago Do you have trolls? Not really because I, I think, yeah, I just usually delete them. Yeah. Yeah. But that's something for, for young girls and boys, the idea of bullying and trolling. For sure. And resilience is a really big part of that. Yeah. How do you screen out the negative and stay focused on the positive? Yeah, and I'm, I mean our brain has a negative bias in it. So if you have – um, five positive interactions with people. Someone compliments your hair. Someone says what a great job you did on that presentation. Someone says that the work you submitted was excellent. People, you only have to say one negative thing for all of that to be discounted. So people can say great things to you all day. Person says one negative thing like, oh, you didn't speak that well on the show. And that really, really hurts you so I think one of the best strategies is just to have enough of a buffer so have enough positive interactions that they totally override the negative ones you can't believe your biggest fans though either can you because then that's not realistic if everyone's just telling you how brilliant you are all day yeah isn't that how isn't that what we do just always <laughs> you and I I noticed that with girl like girls yeah. and their Instagrams and it'll be like oh hot and there's an expectation that that's how you comment on all your mm. you know with young girls that's how they comment on each other's photos you look so beautiful oh my god you're so great mm. you're so beautiful so that's not real either no it's not but it is real to them you know what I mean mm. and I if you put yourself in their shoes and remember what you were like at school and 
you know that it's not the whole world, but for you at that school, when you go there, that is your world. And you don't really have that much visibility or that much perspective on what other people do. And that's why I've always loved reading. Because when you read a book, it does open up your eyes to how other people in the world live and what other people have been through. And I think that, that helps to gain perspective. What were those first couple of months like at home with a new baby? Awesome. Yeah, they were good. They were good, but they were, it was tiring. When you're a new mum, you, you know, you're tired. Yeah. You said you had a lot of people around. Did you rely on your mum a lot? Yeah, my mum was awesome. But like, see, Michael was awesome, but he was like, he was almost too perfect. You know what I mean? Like just, just, you know, when you want to be angry at someone, but mm. they're just like too nice and too perfect that you can't be. He was like that. So he's like irritatingly perfect all the time, which is, you know, it's, it's hard for me to live with someone like that, Mia. <laughs> sounds like a burden and I'm not even joking. Um, did you have a lot of experience with babies? Did you know much yeah, about how to look my, after them? Yeah, because I've got two younger brothers and I was nine when the first one was born. You know, I used to give them baths, I used to push the trolley around coals when mum and I would go shopping, I'd put them in the car. So I did have a fair bit of experience. A fair bit for a 10-year-old girl, you know. Did you have a particular sort of Bible that you used that you referred to? Because there's so many books and there's so much on the internet and so many people with so many opinions. How did you weed through all of that to decide well, what to I, do? I think it's hard because when you have a baby, you've never met them before and they've lived inside you, but they haven't really met you or your partner yet. So you're still working each other out, just like when you meet someone new for the first time. You're still kind of working each other out. So I do think it took us, um, I reckon, like six months to be able to say, yeah, we we know what we're doing now. Yeah. Tell me about your body image after you had a baby. Look, I felt really good about myself. Yeah. I haven't struggled with that expectation of getting my my pre-baby body back and all of that stuff because... My body's never going to be the same because I've given birth to a baby, to another human. So to think that it could bounce back or go back, I think that's preposterous. Like that's really, I think that's a really stupid expectation that people have of themselves. Even though I know they have it and it's, it's an expectation that's sometimes placed on us by other people as well. Did you feel pressure? No, no. What about getting back to your level of fitness and your level yeah, of... Yeah, I think that was more important to me, Mia, because how I feel about myself has always been really strongly tied with my physical abilities. So being in a hospital bed, not being able to walk, not being able to talk, not being able to wipe my own ass, of course I didn't feel like me. You know, forget about the appearance, I didn't feel like me at all. So after having a baby being able to run again and, and surf again and do the things that I love doing, that was of a really high priority for me. Because that's something a lot of new mums talk about, that sort of struggle with identity. It's kind of like, who am I? Yeah. It's so all-consuming motherhood. But yeah. then what about Taria? Where does she sort of fit yeah. in with all of this? Yeah, and that's why that's why I think being a mum is extraordinary and it's magical and it's delightful. But I think it's also important to have – your own stuff going on and your own goals and your own dreams and your own your own vision, I guess, for your life, yeah. What's that been for you? Well, after I had a baby, I, I really wanted to do the Kathmandu Coast to Coast. It's this crazy adventure race from the West Coast to the East Coast. And originally I wanted to do the whole thing and then I had a baby and then the idea of being out all day. You How know, long was it? Well, just hold oh, up there. I'm getting sorry. there. So originally I wanted to do the whole thing, which was 300 kilometres, and just just I haven't finished. And when I had a baby, I, I checked in with myself and I thought, like, do you actually want to be riding on a bike for eight hours and then come home and see your baby? And I realised I didn't I didn't actually want to do that. Do you mean in training for it? Yeah, I was like, oh, I don't I, – I, I've, I've done Ironman, so I know the sort of training that goes into doing something like that, and it's totally consuming – and I thought I don't, I don't actually want to be apart from my baby for that long. So I thought I still want to do it, but I'm only going to do a section of it. So I did the mountain run, which was 30 kilometres to answer your question before. And I think, you know, when I said I was only doing the mountain run, a lot of people said to me, oh, well, that's not, that's not very far. Like you've run further, 
you do ultras. Like that's not very You've got to make some new friends, Tarina. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've even driven 300 kilometres. <laughs> no, but like it's – I think I think this is really important to remember with 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 setting a goal or setting, you know, working towards something that's important to you. It doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. It doesn't even matter what what a previous version of yourself used to be able to do. If, if it's a challenge for you, and it was, I had to run with Huckabee in the pram. I had to wake up at four a.m. before the whole house was awake, so I could get in my training sessions. It, it was a challenge for me, and so I think if you can say it's a challenge for you, then I think it's enough. Did you have those moments of thinking, oh, maybe if I just push myself a bit further or you were realistic about the fact that this is already a big deal, 30 kilometres? Because it's not just like 30 kilometres in a straight line. I've seen the videos. It's across rapids and yeah, up mountains yeah, yeah, yeah. and crazy. over rocks. Yeah. Like climbing over a big boulder yeah. and then, you know, going through rivers up to your waist sort of thing. It's how, crazy. How did you train for it? Just, just ran. That's what I did. A lot of running. But what about the rivers and the boulders? And well, we don't have that. We don't have that where we live. And, you know, people said, I'll come over to New Zealand and train on the course. I didn't want to pack up, take my baby. Just It was too hard, you know, too too hard for what I wanted from the race. I just wanted to do it and have fun. Mm. I didn't want to win it, you know. That was my expectation of it. Before you had Huck of I, did you and Michael used to train together a lot? No, he doesn't like – no, and this is another annoying thing about Michael. He's really fit, so I'd be training and he'd, you know, come along for a ride because I'd beg him to and he'd beat me and, you know, it's it's an ongoing issue. When you train, do you listen to music, podcasts? I listen to music, like gangster stuff, just real badass, you know, just popping caps and stuff like that. Do you have a playlist that you particularly like? I just like Tupac and um, Biggie Smalls, to be honest. They're probably my favourites. And when you compete in – when you no, ran you it – No, you don't listen to music while you compete. You don't? No. Because you've got to stay focused. Well, yeah, and also it's not allowed, so. What was the actual day like and the actual race? Of the race itself. Yeah. It was beautiful. So that's what I mean. I got – I wanted to do an adventure. I wanted to do something epic. I wanted to do something that was a challenge. It ticked all of those boxes for me. And i tell you what was really cool about it, the camaraderie on the course. Like everyone was so – cool and nice you know like if I'd slip on a rock there'd be like a rugged kiwi hand coming down to help me back up and you have to navigate your own way like I think I ran an extra four kilometers because I kept getting lost but if there was people there they'd be like no mate wrong way like it's this way so yeah the camaraderie on the course I've, I've never seen anything like it before and in the video that I saw on your insta Michael and Huckabee there at the end. Yeah, I know. So cute. What was that like? Having them there. Well, this is the thing about being a mum, which I didn't realise. After you finish a race, (laughs) you normally want to have a beer, hot chips, food, onion rings, watch a movie, shower, relax, kick back. But after I finished the race, I got home and then like Huckabee just wanted me. And I'd, I'd... it's strange that I didn't think of that. It's true. It's like he didn't care that you no, just run it. Yeah, he doesn't marathon. care at all. No, no, not at all. It's like babies don't care about weekends. No, or sleeping in or any of that stuff. Yeah, it's like your relationship to weekends changes when you become a parent. Yeah. So everyone's like, "Yay, it's Friday!" And you're like, "Oh no, no, I'll be at home <laughs> with them all day tomorrow." <laughs> How are you feeling about more kids? I don't, we'd love more kids. Yeah. To be honest, Mary, I think if you, if you're and I don't want to use the word blessed because it's so overused, but I think if you're if you're in the true sense of the, the word. The true sense, if you're blessed with a with a baby and you get to have one, I just think, man, how lucky are you, you know, to be able to raise another person and and have this have this person who admires you and who looks up to you and who thinks, you know, you're their hero for the first, you know, five years or whatever. But I think if you if you if you have a baby, I think you're blessed. So we'd love more kids, but who knows what you know what'll happen? Yeah, and, and I, I feel very happy and content with my family as it is right now. What's your day to day like? Um, so Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays is when I when I'm supposed to work. So that's when I you know do my emails and meetings and all of that stuff. I work from home. My mum has Huckabee, and then Mondays and Fridays. Does she come to your house or she takes him and you work at home? She takes him and I work at home, which is good. But then I've got to you got to do the washing, cleaning, you know, cooking that sort of stuff as well. Um, and then on Mondays and Fridays, I, I don't work on those days. I try not to. But when you run your own show, you, you do work a lot. 
outside of normal business hours. You are a lady startup. You do work for yourself. Yes. How would you describe your work? I love what I do. I think it's really awesome. I get to make and create really awesome content, really valuable resources for people like my School of Champions, like Mindset Magic, like Good Selfie. Um, They genuinely love it. I get a lot of awesome feedback. And I think, I don't think that there's anything inherently special about me. Like, I think people go through tough times every single day. And so what I've been through doesn't make me special and it doesn't make me unique and it doesn't differentiate me at all. But I think I'm really proud of my ability to be able to share the lessons I've learnt with people. And then if people walk away from that saying things like, you know, I listened to your story and because of that you made me sign up for my first half marathon. Or a kid at school says, I read your book and, you know, that gave me a lot more confidence so I tried out for the school netball team. So when people tell me stories like that, it it, it makes me feel really good about myself and about the work that I do. You're a big goal setter, I know. What does the next little while look like in terms of goals for you? Personal, physical? Right, you want all of them just to play. So I I think after you you achieve a goal, I think a lot of us miss a really crucial part in the process and that's at the completion of a goal, it's the savouring of completing it. Because a lot of the time, and I I know you would be like this, Mia, you're you're very ambitious, you're a bit of an overachiever. You achieve, then you go into what's next, what's next, what's next. And that's great. But I think sometimes we just don't stop and just acknowledge and savour and relish what we've just achieved or what we've just done. So after I set a really big goal that's really important to me, I like to have a bit of time just to savour in it and reflect on it and think, you know what, I am really proud of myself for doing the mountain running coast in New Zealand for the coast to coast. It wasn't the biggest run. It wasn't the longest run. It wasn't the hardest. But it was my first run since having a baby. I overcame all of those challenges and I'm, I'm really proud of myself for doing it. So I don't have any goals imminent or on the horizon, but I have just written this book that I'm trying to share with as many people as possible. Listen to me going, more kids? What's, what's next? What's, what's next? What's your t- f- right. one-year goal, two-year goal, five-year goal, and then your, your 10-year vision oh, I can never for your that. personal life, you know, fitness, nah. health, family? I just thought that you would have a long list. I've got all these things that I want to do eventually, but I'm still, you know, I'm just enjoying life a little bit more. You know, being able to sleep in, eat uh, p- pastries and things like that. How old's Havakai now? Um, Hakavai. Ha- Hakavai. That's okay. Mispronounce the name of my Tell me about only his name. <laughs> Tariya. How? What, tell me about his name. Well, my... Uh, um, <laughs> Well, his name Huckavai, so how it originated. Michael and I, when we were going through what we went through, I always think it's really good to have like a – when you're going through a tough time, to have a have a highlight at the end of it. So we said to ourselves, when this is – you know, when this intense phase is over, we're going to sail around Tahiti and all of her islands. And Tahiti, that's where I was born. That's where my mum's from. That's where my name's from. So we – did we did that we went to Tahiti we were on our boat sailing around and we met this really beautiful couple and they had this gorgeous little baby boy and I asked the mum in French I said oh what's his name and she said Huckavai and I thought that was such a beautiful name and I, I took a photo of Michael and the original Huckavai and that photo was on my phone for the past I don't know four years or whatever because that that for me that was hope you know that was one day I I might be blessed enough to have a beautiful family of my own. What do you call him for short? (laughs) Huckabye. You're not a nickname kind of a family. I think it's a beautiful name. It is a beautiful name. I didn't say it wasn't. (laughs) But, you know, Australians have a tradition of either shortening or lengthening a name if it can't be shortened. Well, I'm his mum, so I will call him (laughs) Huckabye for the rest of my life. But if other people choose to shorten his incredibly beautiful name... Or like, mispronounce it. Or mispronounce it, which has been done, you know... I've quite, heard that. Yep. And, you know, that's their choice. <laughs> I love you. Yeah. I love him. I can't wait to see what you do next. But I am also really glad that you are just saving every bloody goal you've kicked and every milestone you've reached. This book is sensational. Every 
It's the most brilliant gift for a tween girl or boy, mm. particularly girls, but also boys. They can be really hard to buy for, teens and tweens. And uh, I'm going to be buying these in bulk. And every every birthday party my kids go to, this is going to be the gift they give. Ah, That's good. Congratulations, friend. Thank you, friend. That interview was a lot of fun. Taria just makes me laugh. You can find Taria's new book, Good Selfie, at any good bookstore or at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia. And if you would like more from Taria, if you want to hear more about her accident or just be reminded about how we came to know and love Taria in the first place, Go back and listen to my first episode of No Filter with her or you can also hear her on our parenting podcast, This Glorious Mess. You know, I'm a very forward-looking person and I always say the only time you should look back is to see how far you've come. We'll link both of those in the show notes for this episode. You can read more about Taria's story as well on mamamia.com.au. No Filter is produced by Liza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I'll see you on Mamma Mia.